The meeting come to order. Today is Tuesday, June 27, 2017. This is a study session of the Prescott City Council. Roll call, please. Mayor Oberg? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Lamerson? Here. Councilman Blair? Yes. Councilman Lazell? Here. Councilwoman Orr? Here. Councilman Shiska? Here. Councilwoman Wilcox? Here. All present? Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, we've got a pretty full agenda today. Try and get through and uh, be ready for our voting meeting starting at 3, and there's a pretty heavy agenda on that one, too. So we'll get started. 3A, please. Presentation by Prescott National Forest re regarding building a new facility on city lease property at Pioneer Park. Fergie, I think you're on the wrong agenda. Yeah. Am I? <gasps> I'm sorry. Yeah. Oops, sorry. It's draft on economic development incentive policy. Mayor and Council, Tower's going to give a presentation of a draft economic development policy agenda, but I thought maybe I'd start with some comments about why we're doing this and why we're having this discussion. Uh, first off, you know, as you know, over the course of time, you get economic development opportunities. You have businesses that are looking to relocate to your community. And historically, I think we've had a very ad hoc approach about incentives and the idea of what we're going to give, if we're going to give, how it's going to be structured and the like. And a lot of communities have gone to having a, at least a boilerplate economic development policy that establishes a framework under which you look at economic development incentives. One thing I would like to say very early on, there's no money attached to this. We're obviously not in a financial position to be giving away anything. All this is, is for discussion purposes, you guys deciding if you would like to establish something like this, and if so, is this something, as the structure has been established, that you would consider actually implementing at some future date? And with that, I'll let Tyra go through the nuts and bolts, but I thought it was important that nobody got um, the wrong impression that somehow we were looking to give away anything because we don't have anything to give. All right, thank you, Michael. So just to go through this briefly, um, we pulled together a lot of information from other cities as well as some work that was done in the economic development uh, division prior and put it all together and we talked to Jim Robb and <clears throat> we looked at this, try to do it holistically and make, like Michael said, a boilerplate option um, for an economic development incentive policy. So just to go through it quickly and please, if you have questions or comments, this is this is a working draft and obviously a study session. So. Um, I like, to, I like it to be a dialogue and, and to get some feedback on these things. To start off on the policy, and I have it up on the screen if you'd like to take a look there. We start with the purpose of the policy. It goes through some of the community highlights, kind of just the, the basic generic information. Um, it also talks about a big focus of this policy is that we are focusing on trying to diversify our economic portfolio in the city, which would ideally attract a large number and a various number, a variety of businesses and industries so that it's kind of a safeguard. Um, a big portion of this too, a very important part is if you read in the third paragraph down, um, it says that we will, and it's actually at the top of the page here on the screen, that we will review each request for public incentives and investment on a project by project basis. So each single, every single one of those would come to the council. Um, and nothing would be determined without your guidance and direction there. Um, it also says by adopting this policy, the city is not obligated to offer any incentives or make any investments. This policy shall not be applied retroactively and shall become effective at the date that it's um, passed by the city council. So that's good to know too. Um, even if this was passed, implemented by you, the council, each and every project or application would still come across for your review and you're okay. So that's good to know. Um, moving on, page two of it talks about the, some of the strategies in general that we have as well as listing some targeted businesses and industries. Um, as you see there, some of the, the very general strategies that we have would be to work with local higher education institutions um, and the private sector to bring technology related businesses, attract a conference center, especially downtown, create business incubation space to utilize those skills um, gathered by our local graduates of those universities and colleges, attract destination retailers, 
make the retention and expansion of existing businesses a priority. And then it goes through on this next page a list of examples of those targeted businesses or industries. Um, a few of them are destination retailers, um, aircraft parts, electronic devices, technology development, cybersecurity, manufacturing, engineering, distribution, um, and research and development, just, just to name a few. Um, Mr. Mayor, if I could. Tyler, I I'm, don't mean to cut you off the ankles here. That's okay. Um, this is half the size of our general plan in number of pages. It, it, you lost me after ten, page 10. Just that's my input. Yeah, and that's that's totally fair. And that's that's why we're here is to to get through this, to cut some, to take away, to add if there's pieces that are missing. It's definitely a draft. So we don't take any offense to that at all. This is this is up to you to decide to implement in general or not, or what pieces to keep or what to lose. So Mayor Brotil. Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> here again, I'm a free market kind of a guy. Always have been. I you know, <clears throat> I don't necessarily think it's a role of a municipality to target businesses. I think we make the opportunity for the private sector um, to excel by providing good basic services. Um, <clears throat> I, do, I do see some legitimacy for a company that goes out and tries to promote this stuff, whether it be through the chamber or through the, through the downtown partnership or whatever the, the case is. But the city as a whole, I mean, we treat everybody equally. It's, it's not we don't pick and choose. Um, you know, I, I would have a tendency very similar to what Councilman Lazell was saying. You lost me about nine pages ago, especially when we start talking about targeting businesses. You know, businesses target this community. I mean, it, you got to just flip side it for me. Um, I think the business community says, hey, there's a place I want to go locate my business. And then they come in and talk to us. We don't go out there and talk to them. I'm just sharing that with you. Thank you for that. Council Um Well, I, Mayor Pro Tem, I guess I would take a little bit of a turn from that in that I think it's competitive out there for businesses and for, for opportunities for our city. It's very competitive. And I understand. Um, the desire to somewhat diversify our economy so it's not so totally dependent on mm -hmm. tourism uh, because when things start to take a dive, they really dive in tourism. Uh, but I do think it's great to be proactive and have a plan. Uh, and Michael, you've said it, and you said it this morning when I talked to you earlier, it's easy to be visionary when you've paid your bills. <laughs> Um, and we've got a huge bill before us. I just want to make it very clear to everybody out there. Number one, number one priority, and it was from our strategic planning, and we went through all of our goal setting. Number one priority is to stabilize the general fund. And once we get that done, three, four years from now, five years from now, and, and I do, but I do think it's, it's important that we be proactive. And it's not all about money. I mean, that's what I, there are ways that we can um, be attractive, and we are. We're number one place to live in the Southwest, according to Sunset. That we are an attractive community to come to. But we also need to do our part and kind of meet, and, and there are a lot of different ways to do that through customer service, hand holding, making sure that, you know, when they come and they visit, it's a, it is the place that they want to be. Um, but I just want to make it really clear. We are not talking about spending any general fund money <laughs> on this now or in the future. This is a long way down the road because we've, we've got to take care of our unfunded liability first. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Blair. <coughs> well, I'm maybe a little bit different than Jim, or maybe he just says it different than I do. A lot of people don't know where Prescott, Arizona is, yeah. or even what we have to offer. And I think it's incumbent upon us as a community, if those are the types of things we want to see in this community, that we at least let them know where we're at and who we are so they can make a business decision. Yeah. I see absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, to understand that there's traffic at the airport and different cultures that are tied into the airport, 
uh, I think it's nice to be able to put our message out there somewhere so if anybody is interested they can come see for themselves so I just look at it a little bit differently Councilman Chiska thank you mayor I appreciate that you know Tyler it's great to look up here and you know have my eyes glaze over at all the words we have on this policy but money aside since there is no money what would an incentive look like good question so we can skip to that if you look at so without without attaching money to it we have listed for example right there in the middle of the page an expedited permitting process um, reduce their weight fees and make it a quicker, easier process for them. Uh, talking about infrastructure, proactively providing that infrastructure to areas that we know are going to be retail or employment centers. Um, thinking about that for the future, using our general plan to do that. Um, that's a big part too of attracting businesses, I think, is providing those types of things. So this policy, like we've been saying, is very general. And it's not your typical policy because there is no money attached. We didn't want to do that for those specific reasons we already discussed. But there's things that make the community attractive that if you take this policy, and we can shave it down to a page or two if you really want, and we take it and say, this is what Prescott has to offer as far as lifestyle, quality of life. Um, these are the general things going on. This is, this is what we're looking to do with our policy. These are the businesses that we're really interested in. These are the graduates we have, the degrees they're getting. Um, so that you can take that to a prospective business. If they're inquiring, you can say, hey, here's a couple pages. Take a look. And um, this is who we are. This is what we have to offer. So we can. We can do anything that you want with this. Shape it. Mold it. Yeah, I would prefer, you know, simple is better. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, the KISS concept in this case would be awesome. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mary. I, Tyler, I don't think we're not saying anything any different, if you want in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Advertising yourself is a good thing. I do it every day. I advertise myself. I don't have a problem advertising ourselves. Community is a place people want to come here because we've provided good services. We've provided good infrastructure. We've provided a total environment that people want to come here. They're doing it every day. They're doing it every day. I mean, they're coming because we're marketing ourselves very effectively. So I don't understand what the difference is today than it was yesterday because we were just as competitive yesterday as we are today. And we got people coming into the air park. We got people coming into the downtown. We got people coming out in Willow Creek. We got people coming here because they want to be here. They want to be here for a reason. I agree with Councilwoman Orr. We're number one in this. We're number one in that. We're number one in this. We're number one in that. All over the <clears throat> marketing board out there, Prescott's been ranked in number one place for people to want to be. All right? And that was done through the free market, not necessarily by government. Just sharing it with you. <clears throat> Councilwoman Wilcox. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <coughs> targeting, as you know, <coughs> is part of a strategy for economic development. Excellent. And it's especially important in Prescott because we're limited in water. And we have other uh, transportation limitations right now. So we need to reach out to those businesses and industries that fit that use little water, that take best advantage of our resources that we can offer. Embry-Riddle graduates, highly educated in technology. Um, we've got one of those listed in the targeted industries. I think we have to look at targeted industries as a term of art. And it's, we can't just sit here and wait for them to come. We have to reach out. It is a competitive environment. And we had a presentation from Jim Robb, and I think that he, his message is we need to be more aggressive if we want to diversify our economy and provide jobs, career-level jobs, high-paying jobs for the 
young people who graduate from college here. And I'm, I'm really glad to see this happening. I've been asking for it. I asked, used to ask Jeff Bird every two months, how's that economic incentives policy? Well, something was holding it back. I don't know what it was, but uh, now that you're here, Michael, I think things are, you know, we're beginning to talk about things a little better. <laughs> so thank you. That's it. Councilwoman Orr. Yeah, and Jean, I, I agree as far as the targeting, and um, I just, just want to make sure that we're very clear that we're not talking about tar um, being competitive by giving things and because we're not in the giving stage right now. We're, we're in a position where we need to pay down our unfunded liability. And, but I'm glad that we're being proactive. So I'm not speaking out of both sides here. We need to be proactive. A lot of ways to do this besides doing it financially mm -hmm. and through our customer service and keeping our quality of life the way it is. And, and I do agree with the targeting um, because there are some industries, our businesses that work better in this in our environment than others. So I think that's important. And I do believe we need to be out there because if we just sit back and say, we're so great, we don't need to go do anything, that's, that is not the right attitude to take, that's for sure. And uh, so anyway, I just want to make sure we're not talking about money here. That is correct. I'm, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Well, since everybody else has added their two cents, I guess I can add mine too. Um, basically, I was at a uh, technology conference in uh, <coughs> Phoenix some time back and I had a number of uh, entrepreneurs tell me that, you know, you got to sell yourself. And they're interested in going places that people want them to bring their business there. And if you don't want their business or if you're not even advertise yourself to a particular business uh, to come into your, your community, they're not even going to waste their time coming there. That's number one. Number two, they said you have to have uh, information about your town that's very easy to access. That's re one reason why we're doing the business license so that we have the, the um, um, database that's associated with it so people can come in here and find out what kind of services we have available, what kind of transportation, what kind of suppliers, what kind of manufacturing, that type of information because that's what they start making their information on. First of all, the fact that you would want their business to come there and number two, that they can start to evaluate your town and see, or your city and see if you have what they need to be successful there. Um, they also said, obviously, that dollars are important. I mean, if they could get incentives to come in, uh, that will be an enticement they'd be very interested in. But they said dollars is not all, not everything. They're looking for, you know, um, reasonable housing prices. They're looking for um, quality of life. They're looking for things that uh, their employer employees would be very interested in doing. Many of these the people that we're talking to, of course, were tech companies, and their workforce was very young, basically millennials. And so when I talked about Prescott and what we have to offer here, they said, that's what we're looking for. So it's not always money. It's quality of life and what you have to offer in other ways that, um, you know, will uh, be of great enjoyment to the people that will actually be working in those firms. So um, I, I agree with everything that's been said here, but I think, you know, when you really talk to the people out there that own the businesses, are looking for places to go to um, expand their business or set up a business, um, I think these are things that we need to take a look at. And I think this policy is trying to do that. Okay. Well, at, at this point, um it depends on the council's wish. If you'd like to continue through this, it sounds like there's a general idea of maybe condensing it, simplifying it, but keeping those elements that we've talked about. Let's go on through it. Okay. Um, so let's jump to, let's see where we left off a good point. To, if we go to um, return on investment considerations, and I know that's something that we're all interested in is, is receiving a return on investment for what we're doing. The process that we've outlined in this policy is if a business comes in and they want um, specific investments or incentives, they'd go through the application process, it'd be simple, um, but they would, they would have to answer certain questions to show us what are we going to be getting, what are you going to be bringing to the community. And that would be in the form of this ROI um, in the application process. So some of the things in those bullet points that we'd ask is, well, what's your estimated annual tax revenue? 
from bed tax, from sales tax, from property tax, those things. Um, how many jobs are you bringing that meet, that meet the wage goals that we have? And this policy says that our wage goal is to have jobs that pay higher than the county median salary, which is around $45,000 a year. Um, the next one, jobs provided to Prescott residents, specifically new employees that are coming to the city of Prescott. Redevelopment of underutilized properties or infill development, absorbing space that results in reduced commercial and industrial vacancy around the city. Um, and what's their ability to attract other businesses and industries that we have an interest in, as well as their ability to partner with the city, with the colleges, the universities on workforce development. So we'd be asking those things and they'd provide that in a, in a good form for us to see and review. Um, okay, so we've gone through, uh, there's a few highlighted numbers in here, like those three bullet points there, kind of just outline the, the goals that we'd have as a city, for example, to bring in at least 50 net new jobs per year, um, new jobs that exceed the county median wage, like I already mentioned, and then producing new sales tax revenue at least $50,000 a year. Now those are adjustable, and that's why I highlighted them, because this is up to you to think, is that reasonable? Um, a lot of these numbers I pulled from other Arizona cities, some were bigger, some were smaller, so I try to just include numbers that were maybe realistic, but that's up to your determination as well. Um, let's see here. There, there is a section in here that regards um, employment training um, or reimbursement. Now, considering the fact that we don't want to put any money in this policy at this time, um, it might be wise to exclude that portion. Um, but generally, cities do offer something with workforce training reimbursement. Some do a percentage up to a certain amount. Some just do a, a set certain amount. Um, but that, again, is up to you to leave in or take out. I have a question of Tyler. Um, Tyler, I know that uh, NACOG offers workforce training, and I wonder if you have talked with them about how the city might be involved or lead businesses to the NACOG program. That's a great suggestion. I have not, but that's something I can definitely do. Yeah. Okay. Because they have a separate source of funding. Just for that workforce development. Yeah. yeah. Good. And maybe, maybe Wendy knows. I don't want to put her on the spot, but then maybe that's something we can bring back later if, if not right now. Okay. So. Well, now I just want to say I, I think I think we're on the right track, as far as trying to be proactive. You know, try to, what might this look like? And 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 just, this is the first time we've all had the opportunity to, to see this and mm -hmm. be with it. And uh, so I appreciate the work you've done, Tyler. And I agree with what the mayor said. You know, that we, it is competitive out there. I mean, it is. Some people are almost giving away the whole store in order to get people to come. We don't need to do that in Prescott because we are a wonderful place to be. But we do need to we do need to target and make sure that um, we are diversified in this economy because mm -hmm. this is this is really tough. <laughs> when when things go bad, then we want to make sure that we're we're in a good spot for our city. And and I think that's the, the prudent and the responsible thing to do. So I appreciate the work you've put on this. Well thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Councilman Lazell. Thank you, Mayor. Tyler and I'm, I appreciate the work you're doing on this. I really do. But I just want to make it clear, whatever wording we choose as a council to go with, that we don't forget everybody that's put Absolutely. their blood, sweat, and tears already up to this point in this community. And that we're not looking for, you know, I don't want to pick this apart, but expedite a permit. I mean, we've got people that are putting millions of dollars in this community right now that we don't expedite for. Mm -hmm until something seriously goes wrong and then we push it through and b backpedal and stuff. So I'm glad I, what I'd like to see is that, you know, we will improve these departments so everybody can almost be expedited. So mm -hmm. <laughs> customer service. And yeah. And, and I, I, I respond? Go ahead. And, and I absolutely agree, Greg. Today we had Wendy Bridges on the radio with us and uh, Steve and I did and, and we talked about retention and what, what do we do with our current businesses in place right now to help them and, and a lot of that is goes back to our strategic plan where we're talking about customer service and this isn't we don't just give good service to people coming in we give good service to everybody that's here because so it's like a it's like a 
cable or credit card you know they're trying to get the new co uh, customers but you know screw the person that they oh are. yeah and, and and that's and that's where our jobs are with the people that are with us right now and helping them helping them prosper so totally agree I don't see this in conflict at it's, all. it's not yeah and you're both on dead, dead on and I've always felt very strongly and we talked about this as we put this together recruitment is great retentions easier and retention and expansion are the really the way to go because Absolutely. these people have already made a commitment to the community and part of this policy would allow for that it would it's, it's mentioned all throughout is okay much along with attracting you really want to retain because yeah and here. also maybe in this we we we, we include expansion yes. yes it is yes as well okay. yeah and thank you for that that's that's good on blair yeah, i would agree with that 100 percent you know retention you know we have a couple of great folks at the air park european technology is one of them and they started building that business as three people look where they're at today I just don't want to be the community that, or be the person that kills the goose that laid our golden egg as far as our quality of life and things that people come here for. At some point in time, we have to, it's like building the park. Sometimes you don't have enough money to build the park. Spend more money on the parks you have to make them the very best they can be. And I think we need to have a good element of that. Mayor Brett, Thank you. I uh, echo, I echo Blair a little bit, and I echo uh Lizelle a little bit you know there's a lot of people that have put a lot of money blood sweat and tears into this community to make it the place a lot of people want to come okay and you know one of the reasons why a lot of people want to come here is because we don't look like phoenix because we don't look like las vegas because we don't look like los angeles you know <laughs> like blair said let's not kill the goose that laid the golden egg the golden egg happens to be who we are and I'm, you know, let's be the best that we can be at who we are, but we don't have to change who we are by going out and getting a whole bunch of newbies to come here at the expense of the taxpayers of the city that has created a place that a lot of people want to live. Um, understanding we, as, as Councilwoman Wilcox was saying, we do have limited supplies of this. We do have limited supplies of that. Um, I don't have a problem marketing who we are, but let's market it truthfully. I mean, fact of the matter is we are who we are. We're not, we're not Phoenix and we're not Los Angeles. I mean, we're Prescott, Arizona, and I'd like to keep Prescott, Arizona, Prescott, Arizona, the world's oldest rodeo, Arizona's Christmas city. You know, there's a lot of things here that we have that no place else has. And sometimes be careful of what you wish for because you just may get it. Well, I think, too, that, uh, you know, by bringing in other businesses in here and, uh, you know, keeping our young folks here and utilizing our universities and everything else, it's going to lift all the boats. You know, all the other businesses here will benefit from these other businesses coming in and, and you know, retaining our young people here and providing a lifestyle that supports those people. So, you know, I, I don't see this as a one-off. This, this, this supports everybody. Keep going. Well, that, that covers all of the basic elements of the policy. Um, with council's direction, I'm happy to take this back. We can work on it, bring it down, focus on those areas that we've discussed most, and we can bring it back at a further date to talk um, more. I talked to the city manager sometime back about reconvening maybe on a semi-annual basis the um, Economic Development Committee that I started when I first became mayor. Um, they gave us a report, um, I think November of last year, where they kind of laid out where it, what they saw as the future of Prescott and some of the things that we could be doing. Um, so I, I think it's important to have them come back. Maybe we can see how much of what they recommended we've actually been able to accomplish, number one. But number two, I think uh, they would be very interested in, in having uh, an opportunity to, to review and give input on this uh, particular uh, policy and I think that's important. I think it's a great suggestion and we definitely could have those folks get around the table talk about some of the things we've done over the past year to sort of change the paradigm with Jim Robb at the table and also let them look at the economic incentive policy because obviously they're private sector folks they could speak for the private sector better than we can as to whether or not we're on the right track with some of this. 
And Mayor, the other thing ab about that group also is that they're the people that have put a lot of money into yep. this town and city already. So I, I think that would be a really good place to start. We definitely can do that. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I also think that uh, just like they had the Phoenix 40, you know, they talked about maybe the Prescott 10. Um, <laughs> but I, I really think that, uh, you know, that if people see the benefit of this, that we could have um, some of the businessmen in town probably start some kind of an incentive package uh, that would be um, used to bring in some of the, the types of businesses or uh, tech technologies that we want to have here. It's not going to happen right away. Uh, people are going to want to see how this thing all bears fruit first. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't be a bit surprised uh, in my talking to the to the businessmen here that um, they realize that they need to um, support this community and, and help bring in the businesses that are going to make us grow. And with that, that's all I have for you. Okay. No further questions, comments on this one? Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, Mayor Pro Tim's favorite discussion. You want to read B? I'm sorry. B, discussion of alarm ordinance. You want me to lead the discussion? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. There was a couple of us here when this first got started. And they, the alarm ordinance in the city of Prescott was started because you had over 2,300 unauthorized disarmaments of alarms in the community. And that necessitated a lot of police workforce, a lot of time and cost of the city. And every time you take a cruiser, off the street to go answer a, 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 an unauthorized uh, occurrence, what you end up doing is you're taking a cop out of the, his duties of protecting the public. That's how this started. The good thing that came out of the alarm ordinance was it was treated that if, if you can't control your alarm or you can't control the people responsible for handling your alarm, then taxpayers shouldn't pay for that the business should. And that's one of the things that was a positive. Um, it's worked well. The false alarms, as it's called, I don't believe in false alarms, there's no such thing. There's a disarmament of an alarm system, but that what that means is some place is not secure that should be secure. That's what that means. Now, but that's not the taxpayer's responsibility to fix it. The problem that we have here is then all of a sudden we started charging registration fees and licensing for permission to own an alarm, which I happen to consider private property. And it's also a Second Amendment issue. Uh, some of us choose alarms to protect our property and our families and our businesses and things like that. And I think it's an intrusion on, on your Second Amendment right. If we're going to charge people for permission to own an alarm in the city, charge them for permission to own a gun. You can better treat everybody equally. If you're not prepared to handle that one, don't handle this one. And it's the same thing with automobiles. I mean, if you're going to charge somebody who has a false alarm uh, because they had a false alarm, have to register their vehicle or their alarm with the city, then do that with a vehicle too. Treat everybody equally. Otherwise, just pe penalize bad behavior. Bad behavior is when you don't take care of your property. The city doesn't owe it to a property owner to take care of their property. The property owner owes it to the city that they will maintain their property. That's where I'm at. I, I personally can live with a penalty part of it. What I can't live with is the registration part of it for my permission to exercise my Second Amendment right or anybody else to exercise theirs. Okay, before we go to Councilman Lizelle, let me just see if I can understand a couple things here. Um, so we passed the ordinance basically to try and cut down on the number of um, unauthorized um, That's right. alarms. And it was very effective. And it was a penalty for doing that. And by doing that, we actually did get a reduction Absolutely. in uh, uh, false alarms. Absolutely. But then after that, at some point, or was it at the same time, <coughs> that they decided to reg have a registration fee just for having it? It was at the same time. Same time. 
yeah, and I didn't like it then and I don't like it now. And I just wanted to redress it or readdress it and measure the effectiveness of what we've done over the past several years because it's been implemented now for I think three years, four years, and uh, just to see how effective it has been. David, do you want to speak to the registration fee and what it is? Sure, just for clarification, Mayor, Council. Um, the registration fee for an alarm system only comes into effect after the first false alarm. And then there's a $10 registration fee. There's no further assessment unless there's another false activation of the alarm. This is a very common practice. It's actually model policy that's recommended from the industry that alarms be registered. Um, I'll also tell you that I eliminated that registration in the last city I worked for. So, um, but I haven't seen how that had an effect on their false alarms and, and the monitoring of that. This is all intended to get voluntary compliance when it's not voluntary that people are responsible with their businesses and homes and how those activations occur. Uh, because we had 2,100 in, in the year 2016. Three of those activations actually were because of a crime. So that's a lot of, a lot of work that's um, on behalf of the officers in Prescott responding to things that, as if they're real, that vast majority, vast, vast majority are not. As you should, and I appreciate that. And those people who have unauthorized disarmaments of their personal property that require you to go there should be held accountable for that. Uh, I do not agree with the registration for it any more than I would agree that every time you write a ticket in the city of Prescott, now you make somebody register their car with the city, too. Um, I mean, nobody's denying you the freedom to own your vehicle any more than they're denying me the freedom to own my alarm, but you are requiring me to do it. That's not penalizing bad behavior. That's penalizing my right to own the property. And I, that's one of the issues I have a problem with. As far as the... Um, penalty part of it, that has worked. If I made a mistake, um, how many alarms did we have in 17? We don't, it's year to date, it's, it's on track as it was in 2016. So it really hasn't affected, I mean, last I, last I checked, if I'm not mistaken when we did this, it was because we had 2,300. And now you're saying now we have 2,100? That was in 2016, we had 2,100 activations, and that's all. That includes um, panic alarms and robbery alarms and burglary alarms. And was everybody equally penalized? Right, the, the, the penalty, and, and I think you're talking about the registration of the alarm as a penalty, but that we don't know if somebody has an alarm system unless there's an activation. Well, when, when, wasn't once a there crime. is one, you do know they have it. We do have. Yeah. So why should they have to register? to register? You know they got it. <laughs> so I just, it just the whole thing sort of seems ludicrous to me from that perspective, and I'm not trying to be nitpicking on this. What I'm trying to do is see has it been effective, and from what I'm hearing, it hasn't been terribly effective. If in the period that it's been in place, we went from 2,300 to 2,100, the, the 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 intent was to go from 2,300 down to maybe two or 300. And my understanding, Mayor Pro Tem, and maybe John, you can help me, that the the registration was part of the ordinance in 2011, and so we did see pretty good reduction in false alarm activations in those early years. It's, it's back up, and there's a lot of theory about that, whether um, the $50 isn't really a significant enough financial impact after you're, when you're on your third activation um, to, to change behavior. Uh, we know from businesses, some of them just write it in to their financial plan because they have an employee base such that they know that they're going to have false activations. Those, that's where I think we can have an impact is looking at those, those um, businesses, and it's primarily businesses that have multiple activations. And you've probably heard or read a little bit about verified response um, from Prescott Valley. They're actually considering that as a council 
um, you can have enhanced response or even no response for chronic abusers. People who simply fines aren't getting it, asking them to comply, educating them is not getting the desired result. We can look at those as a way of reducing our, our false alarm response. You, and so at this point, you don't particularly have a recommendation how to take the 21, because that's got to cost us a lot of time out of the police department. No, no question. That's got to cost us a lot of money out of the police department. I mean, yeah. any way you cut it. And it's got to expose this community to, to danger. Mayor Pro Tem, I didn't come here today prepared with a recommendation because I didn't know what the conversation was going to be um, prior to, to right now. So um, I can certainly look at the data. It's a little bit challenged right now. We're in the process of implementing software that will automate a lot of this and give us a lot of information just at hand. Mm -hmm. Right now we have to dig quite a bit to get that information, but we can get it. I would be happy to hear all of your recommendations and work with the city manager and come back with some recommendations in terms of change to the ordinance. Yeah, not trying to put you on a spot, Chief, at all. What I'm trying to do is to see how effective a policy's been. If it hasn't been effective, what can we do to make it more effective? And what can we do to reduce the amount of wasted time of a limited resource, our police officers, mm -hmm. that puts this community in harm's way when they're answering false alarms when they should be out catching criminals? Mayor Pro Tem, I think those are all reasonable questions. And as the chief alluded to, we wanted to open it up to a dialogue, an open dialogue, to see if council was interested in revisiting this ordinance and tweaking with it. Additionally, if there was other measures we thought we should be, cons you guys thought should be considered to bring down the a number of um, <coughs> unauthorized, um, what's the word you've been using? Unauthorized disarmament. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Councilman Lazell. With respect to my fellow councilman, Mayor Pro Tem, I, I don't care what you call it. Um, but I will say that I am for, it sounds like you're already on top of it, Chief, uh, getting rid of the registration. Okay. But I would like to see one false alarm, or whatever that verbiage is, um, is, is, is no penalty. And after the second one, um, you exponentially go up. It goes right to $100. 200, 400, 600, 1,200. I will tell you at the college, um, I have instructions with our monitoring company to call me first. And through my phone, I can go right and get the camera view of that alarm and see if anybody's there, what's going on. So, um, and then if for some reason they can't get a hold of me and you guys are dispatched, I charge that to that department. That, 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 Fine. So I'm for putting some teeth into this, okay. and but not penalize people that <coughs> are doing it right. Councilman Shiska. Thanks, Mayor. How many alarms are registered, Chief? Do you know? Right off the top of your head. Off the top of my head, I don't have that. Okay. Number. I know you're not prepared today to to do this, so I appreciate that. Um, was just wondering. You know, back in 2011, uh, Councilman Lamerson and Councilman Blair were here. Um, what was our thinking back then? We didn't like it then either. Okay. okay. Well, the thinking was, at that time, we had a very competent chief. Um, his name was Cable. And the idea was to try and reduce the amount of unauthorized disarmaments of businesses and homes, home invasions, whatever the case is. It's not just the businesses that do it, but they're the most um, frequent. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, you can't have your cops going to a place three and four times a month because somebody doesn't know how to operate their equipment or because somebody doesn't take care of their equipment. I mean, that costs the taxpayers. It exposes our cops. It exposes everybody in the community. You can't do that. That's why we worked through this, and we were going to give a trial period. We're here. This is the trial period. How okay. effective has it been? Okay, over the four years, I just heard from Chief, we've gone from 2,300 down to 21. Is that really that effective 
at this point. Okay, if it's not that effective, how do you still look at this and say it's not a problem? Because it is. If you have 2,100 mm -hmm. dispatches that puts this community in harm's way over, over a period of a year, there, there's got to be a better way to fix this. Well, you know, yeah, just to kind of continue on with that, I was just wondering what the thought process was behind doing it, registering an alarm after the first. Actually, it was not after the first. Initially, Steve. It was third. It, no, it was registered up front. Uh, I know that because Chief Cable and I discussed it. This is prior being beyond council. He came to me because uh, of things I did in Phoenix. And it was the, the, the intention was to know who is out there. Oh, Does that yeah. sound familiar? Okay. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. So, yeah. so Chief, what? What in other cities has been successful? In 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 Glendale, was there something like this that you can point to? Councilman Lazell, we went through a very painful process of it was cost recovery. Um, revenue generation, so we implemented a fee for all registrations for alarms. Um, after less than a year, it was so dramatically negative re response from the community. We reduced, we decided to eliminate the, the registration fee, but actually eliminate registration. I have not reached back to see what effect that's had, had if any. Um, I do know that the industry recommends registration, um, but you know, go to another city. Phoenix has a very, very robust alarm program where it's registration, where it's actual hands-on training for people who are chronic abusers of, of false alarms and, and then an aggressive fine schedule. That's worked for them. It hasn't necessarily worked in the surrounding um, communities down in Phoenix. That's about the extent of my direct knowledge. I'd be happy to do a little bit more um, research on registration, charging for registration, what is the value of well, having that information. I'd just like to know what a successful plan looks like. Yeah, I, I agree. And this gives us a good opportunity to, to look at what's out there. I know, again, Prescott Valley has gone the direction of verified response. There's only 17 agencies in the entire country that use verified response. There's only one other in the state. Um, I don't feel as even though we do have 2,400 or 2,100 responses in 2016, I think that's a very extreme measure, and and I would not stand here and recommend that today. I think that we could address those individuals or businesses that really do have a problem following you know what we need them to do and 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 voluntarily fixing whatever is broken so that we don't have repetitive response at that location um, we can work on that end and then you know be more measured in everybody else that just makes a mistake now and again and I think it's important we make clear Steve um, that we're talking about burglar alarms here and not not fire alarms right yeah because there are two different animals yes that's correct and our, our ordinance actually penalizes people who have i'm not going to get the terminology right so i'm not even going to try <laughs> um that falsely activate a, a panic alarm or a robbery alarm that's that's unusual so that's something else i would look at um, in terms of maybe removing those from the ordinance. The other thing um, that I, I do know that we could have a positive effect is right now we have alarms at a very high priority in terms of our dispatch and our response. We dispatch within about 36 seconds on average. That doesn't give somebody an opportunity to say, whoops, I better call my alarm company, I better call the police department so they don't send somebody out. So operationally, we might be able to look at some things that could actually reduce those, those responses as well. When you have uh, an officer respond, is it just one or do you have a backup? No, sir, we, we dispatch two at a minimum. Two. Okay. If it's, if it's a, you know, a large 
facility. It could be four. Yesterday it was six. I can attest to that because it was during a holiday that my server room went off, which was an anomaly. And the officer, I met the officer there, and he had to wait for the other officer because to search the building properly. Yes. Okay. Uh, Councilman Wilcox. Chief Black, isn't the purpose of registration uh, so that the police department knows who to contact when an alarm goes off? Uh, Councilman Woman Wilcox, yes, but usually that's it's coming from the other direction. It's either coming from the alarm company on occasion. It's an audible alarm that somebody, a neighbor or somebody might be calling in. We might have that information, but if they have not had a previous activation, they wouldn't be registered with us. The other thing that, that it doesn't take into account is all of the DIY kind of alarm um, features you can have in your home without being connected with an alarm company um, at all. And so, and those wouldn't even come out as an alarm because if my phone activates right now to show that my camera is activated because of motion in my house, that's not an alarm. That's somebody's in my house, you need to get there quick. And there's more and more of that technology that Councilman Lazelle uh, referred to that we can rely on so that A, we have is the best information we can possibly have before the officers uh, arrive. But, but secondly, if, if it isn't anything, we don't dispatch on it. So what do you mean by un, uh, unverified response or verified response that Prescott Valley is? They won't go unless either through technology, so video or audio to the alarm company or somebody arriving there on their own. Uh, the alarm company dispatching the homeowner or business owner arriving and finding that there's entry, then they will dispatch. So it is frightening. So if we had a registration system where someone registers up front uh, and the an alarm goes off, is it feasible or good practice for uh, 911 or your department to call the person on the registration form and ask, are you, are you repairing your alarm or see if they're even there or aware of it? Councilwoman Wilcox, I don't believe that that's practical um, and I don't think that's really the way it's designed. The registration is more for accountability after the fact since 99% of the alarms are not a crime, then the registration gives us all of that information on where to send the bill. Okay. Councilman Blair. Thank you. Um, I think we get tired, of, at least I do, I get tired of tap dancing around the real problem and thanks Jim for bringing it up. The real problem is, is people aren't taking care of business. And I get aggravated when I'm driving down the road um, on the weekend and they have signs up, workers present. And it gives a false security to the guy that's driving the car that there really are workers there. And what we're doing to our police officers, we're giving them a false security. When they show up at the same place four or five times, and then they become complacent about what they're doing, and that would happen with me, oh, it's just another false alarm. And then this one time, somebody's actually in the house. That's an issue. Mm -hmm. And from my standpoint, first one's free, and then jump those fines up as high as you can jump them until the person becomes responsible for their own problem. It's the safety of our officers, and I think we owe it to the fire, police department to do that. Instead of walking around saying, we need to register them, that doesn't do any good. Not one bit of good, because after it goes off the first time, you know who they are. You know who they are. So send them a bill and send them a big bill. Councilwoman Orr. Uh, yes, Chief, I've been reading the, you know, because Prescott Valley's been dealing with this, I've been reading, I agree on the, the verified, so basically just not sending somebody uh, until you're verified that it is, yeah. I, I don't think we want to go, because public safety is what we're talking about here, we're talking about safety of property and of people, and um, I guess I would like to have more data, I, you know, exactly how much is this coming, two officers mm -hmm. dispatched 2,100 times. Um, that's expensive. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you could do uh, some research and find us the best practice. I know cities and towns are struggling with this, so I'm sure that there's been some success out there somewhere. And, uh, and also exactly a dollar amount. How much is this costing us? 
Absolutely. And, and I agree, it's kind of the boy who cried wolf, you know, after a while. Right. And, and I, I think that there's good methodology for dealing with those chronic abusers. Yes. And, and, and I think that's appropriate. Um, full, full knowledge, you know, that, that we don't spring something on them, but we let them know. Sure. We're going to stop coming because you haven't taken care of business. So the 2100, how many of you of those would you say are chronic? I couldn't tell you, but I will have that, that for would, you. That would yeah. be the kind of data yeah. I think would help yeah. us. And, and just so everybody is clear, we don't actually, what we gain is time in an officer's day that they're not responding to these. We right. gain time um, with dispatch so that they're not having to answer these calls and Absolutely. relay the information and put it into the system. We don't actually, it's not going to save the city money, but it will yeah. give officers time to be present uh, downtown yeah, and <laughs> proactive on, yeah, on other but, matters. But the other side of that too though, Southview, let's take Southview, all those big houses out there. They're 12 miles out of the center of town. You take two officers and send them out of there. Yeah. It is costing time and money, yeah. fuel, mm -hmm. uh, the time where that man is not doing what he's supposed to be or that lady. And it's just absolutely crazy that we can't put teeth in it to make that person be responsible. And it's not a registration, by the way. Loud and clear. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> here again, Chief. Hope you understand the reason for bringing this up, because we agreed to again. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, <clears throat> there's an old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, this is still broke. It ain't been fixed. All right? Um, and very similar to Councilman Blair and Councilman Lozell and Councilwoman Orr, my Jean down here. Guys, every time you take a cop off the street, you put 40,000 other people in harm's way. You don't have that right. You have a right to own an alarm. What you don't have a right to do is allow your alarm to put this community in harm's way. Now, how do we fix it? Where do we go from here? And that's sort of why I wanted to have this conversation again. If we got 2,100 from 2,300 in four years, what we came up with wasn't very effective. And Blair might be right, okay? Lazelle might be right. There's no three times. Maybe it's one time in a calendar year. Maybe it's Instead of $50, it's $100, $200, $300. But at some point, repeat offenders, regardless of what kind of offender it is, do not have the right to put a community in jeopardy. They do not. How do we stop that? I appreciate the opportunity to look at the ordinance, look for areas that we can improve in our own operation as well as what we convey to the community about our expectations for them to be responsible with their systems that they're using to protect themselves and their businesses. I understand that. I, I value that. This is what we have told people, that if you want to be safe, especially if you're going to be away, here's one way to do it. And so we don't want to remove that or make that so punitive that people are afraid to use it, because I've heard that as well. I'm so afraid of getting a false alarm. I'm not going to I'm not going to even try. That defeats the purpose as well. So I think that there's a nice measured approach that we can take and I'll be happy to bring some recommendations back to you. That's sort of why we omitted from the ordinance to begin with fire alarms because you don't no. all it all it takes is once. Okay? You know, somebody can die in 3 minutes because they didn't want to press a false alarm. So yeah. it's you know Councilman Jessica. The Chief, I'm just looking for something that's reasonable. I mean, from a retailer here in town, I've seen all sorts of alarms. I mean, I've seen where, you know, a skunk gets in the store and uh, it sets off the alarm. I've seen where a, a one of the alarm sensors goes bad and that sets off the alarm. And then I've seen where this last winter we actually got broken into. And, um, you know, so I mean, it's all over the place. And, and, and realistically, it's not as though, particularly in a business, that, you know, it, it's something that you can control. 
So, you know, I mean, I know that it sounds per in a perfect world. Yeah, one, you know, once it's free and twice it's, you know, a uh, hundred dollars and, you know, I mean, uh, I could put out a sign out in front saying no skunk skunks allowed, but the truth of the matter is, is that that you know need. we're 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 not dealing in a perfect situation here. So we need to have something which is reasonable. Well, uh, no matter what we do, Steve and I agree with you that reasonable is good, but then there's a responsibility of the owner of that alarm, uh, just like anything else, a oh, responsibility, yeah. and and whether you need. Uh, uh, for, for instance, I've put, been putting cameras all over the cam uh, campus so I can verify these things from remote areas and make the call. Well, the problem is, is that the, you know, the, that's great to say and in a perfect world verifying is, is, is great. But, you know, I, I do know <coughs> that, that by the time we would have verified when we got broken into, those guys were long gone. They were long gone by the time the police arrived. And so, you know, um, I just like something which is reasonable, which is, is, is not setting people up for failure, and which is going to accomplish what Councilman Lamerson wants to do, which is to reduce the, ha the use of two policemen off of their beats to go check out what could be a false alarm or what could be a reason, you know, a, a real alarm. I agree, Steve. I mean, reasonable is a good word. I can remember one time we had a power outage. The city was dark. God bless our cops. They went by to check and did this with their light. And of course, with motion detectors, guess what the light does? <laughs> with a mirror. Gosh, was that a false alarm or was that a cop alarm? <laughs> <laughs> Just sharing it with you. It's, it's, there's, there's a reasonable approach to, to, to penalty. Who should be penalized, me or the cop? I'm you punched in. Was that your comment? Yeah, that was okay. it. Well, I think we beat this one to death. I'll just say a couple of things. And uh, I know in a town I lived in, the people next door had alarm. And every time they were gone and the wind blew, there was a cop walking around the house because apparently it some window or some door or some place moved just enough that it set off the alarm. Uh, never happened when they were there and then we had wind storms, but so I guess they were probably called. I think we also looked at one time uh, having people when they did the business license annotate whether or not they had an alarm. Uh, did we ever do that or did we? Is that part of the dialogue? It was part of the dialogue and never included. Okay. It wasn't included in the business or uh, license ordinance. Okay. Um, well, I think what I'm hearing here is we need more information. Uh, I think we knew, need to review the ordinance and make some changes, but I think until we get a little more information as to what the real data is on the problem, I think uh, we'd be kind of telling the city attorney to start revising something without really knowing where to go. So um, why don't we get this on the calendar again in a couple of weeks or a month? Uh, the latest. We'll certainly do that, Mayor. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any other questions? Okay, next item, please. C, deadly weapons and city buildings policy. <coughs> okay, who will start this one off? I didn't put this on the agenda, but I got a lot to say about it. <laughs> um, I think in a society where without the school ground or the federal buildings um, where I am in a, uh, a certified um, concealed carry even though in the state law now you don't have to have a certification of concealed carry uh, and then I come up here and I gotta put my weapon in that box out there and God bless Larry I mean he's there but uh, I walk out of this building or walk out in that lobby and there's some hostile people out there about some decisions were made here and there's those that depend on law enforcement or good deeds that maybe they won't uh, be a victim but I for one think that uh, I should have the right to, to protect myself okay I think uh, I'd like to have the city attorney just tell us quickly what is the 
what are the codes here so we know what we're talking about? Well, I think if the issue is um, public, the public carrying uh, firearm into city building, um, it's a council sort of policy decision. Um, the rule is is that the, that the city can ban firearms in city buildings as long as we provide a locker like we do. Uh, I know there was some indication when the item first got on the agenda about whether employees, non-law enforcement employees should carry weapons or be allowed to carry weapons. And I think that's a, a manager HR policy right now in your packet, I think you have the HR policy that talks about violence in the workplace. So that's kind of a separate issue for the council's discussion. The question is, and, and today obviously you can't make a decision for discussion purposes only, is whether to whether or not to allow um, people, the public, to carry firearms in the city buildings. I would suggest that to the extent you want to do that, it's really a facility by facility, building by building analysis. Because I will, I would suspect that the police department's not going to allow anybody to carry a firearm past the security window, um, and so I think you need to assess each each city facility um, for a, again, if you decide to go that route, for what where it might be appropriate and where it would not be appropriate, and, and I think the larger issue may be looking at. Um, expanding security measures where the, there's a public staff interaction like you know you have out here for instance on the right side as you're walking out you have essentially bullet resistant glass and Kevlar walls for customer service and on the left side you have it completely open so you know you go to public works same same deal so there is that that's also perhaps a, something to discuss down the road as well now, if somebody um, has a weapon in a car and, and works here and they they come and park outside, there's no issue. Yeah, that, that actually is expressly allowed by the statute that we cannot restrict somebody from storing their weapon in their vehicle in the parking lot, whether it's an employee or a member of the public. Now, we have, uh, you know, a weapon locker or whatever you want to call them on the south side. I don't believe we have any on the west side. Here. I don't believe we do either. So is there's, there's, well, there is a sign. There's a sign that says if you have a weapon, go, go around right. the other side. Go around the other side or uh, perhaps walk through the building. I'm not sure. They're, that's a little inconsistent. Well, they might just walk all the way through Exactly. Here. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. Just curious. Um, and, and there is no distinction, between, as, as Council Member Lizelle said, <clears throat> in Arizona, the right to it's a presumptive state, so you, you can carry concealed with or without a concealed carry permit. Or, um, so there's no distinction anymore. There used to be sort of a distinction about whether somebody with a concealed carry could carry someplace where people didn't have a, a, a CCW could not. Now there is no, for, there's no distinction anymore. So essentially, whether you have a CCW or not, you can carry concealed. And if the council determines that it's going to allow the public to carry firearms in particular city facilities, it wouldn't matter whether they have a CCW, which requires background checks and a short online class you have to go through, I believe, still, um, and someone who simply carries concealed as a matter of right. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I fully understood what John just said or not. Um, very similar to Councilman Lazelle. You know, as I look out in the audience out there, I don't see anybody I know might be a criminal. Most of those people I know, but you know, at the end of the day, anybody can walk in that front door. You don't know what they got in their pocket, all right? What I'm being told is I don't have the opportunity to protect myself. And when you see people getting shot all over this country, schoolyards, city buildings, county buildings, you name it, Walmarts, whatever, you know, I, I don't think it's appropriate to tell me like Lizelle, I have a concealed weapons permit, and effectively all that means I went through the FBI background checks and all this other crud that they made. And it's not crud. I mean, it's, it's legitimate. I understand why they do that. But anybody else, through the infinite wisdom of state legislature, doesn't have to go through a background check, and yet they can walk through that front door with a gun. All right? 
and I'm being told that I can't protect myself up here unless I put my gun in a locker and I'm going to have to tell them, well, hold on a minute, let me go get mine too. <laughs> you know, I have a real problem with this whole thing. So I think we need to poop can the gun ordinance and, you know, just fire beware. There, uh, you may have four or five guns sitting up here. Councilwoman Wilcox. I don't know what to say. <laughs> that means you can bring yours in, Jane. No, no, no. I, I, I think there's a much bigger problem, and that is we don't have reasonable gun control in this country. There are too many gun-happy, gun-toting people out there who don't have a responsible state of mind about using their guns. Yep, anybody can walk in here. And I remember the day when board of supervisor in Maricopa County named Mary Rose Wilcox was shot during a meeting. I think we all face, the, face that risk every day, whether we're sitting at the dais or walking out the door or walking to the grocery store. There's a risk everywhere around us. We're, we're well-known public figures. We have our pictures in the paper and on the internet and on cable TV. Allowing people to bring guns into City Hall is going to change that. I'm happy with the rule we have. It follows state law. If somebody's carrying a gun, they can put it in the locker. That's the rule, and I think we ought to keep it that way. And the guy that's crazy is going to do that. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm asking, uh, where do we want this to go? Do we want to bring this up as a vote on whether or not uh, we want to continue with the current policy or we want to change the policy? I would like to see an up and down vote, but not willy-nilly a responsible uh, ordinance, and we all can vote appropriately. Um, and if Chief feels that you know her lobby, and I'll respect that, um, or any other department that doesn't want them, but I think uh, we need to see something that we can go up or down on. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with Greg on it, but I mean, you know, people are getting stuck too. We had a couple of pretty nasty stabbings here not too long ago. You know, people are getting run over. We had people using a car as a deadly weapon in several places. I don't know where you want to start and where you want to stop. The fact of the matter is, I'm not going to subject myself from being put in harm's way by not being armed. I mean, that's just the way it's going to work. Um, unless somebody else out there in the United States can figure out what to do about the bad guys. The bad guys don't have any rules, and if they did, they wouldn't follow them anyway, and that's why they're the bad guys. So the only people that we affect by having these kind of ordinances are the good guys. So in order to <laughs> try and make the bad guys... the good guys? Well, the ones that don't commit crime, the ones that just don't go kill people, the ones that just don't go shoot people, there are good people out there, Gene, that carry guns. Not everybody that has a gun is a bad guy. <clears throat> yeah, See, you know, I, I guess I, I should throw this out, too, <clears throat> um, because, like I said, originally the discussion involved both whether the public should be allowed to carry firearms and employees. Um, we talked to our Southwest Risk, our insurer. Um, they obviously don't make policy for their insured their cl their clients their customers um, but they'll tell you their opinion uh, and the concern they had was that um, it may create uh, anxiety or concerns that employees would have if if the if the rule goes away certainly if employees were allowed to carry firearms uh, per frankly I would have some concerns <laughs> Not naming names, but uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't blame you, John. I'm just kidding. We have so, unstable people that work for the city. I'm not saying that. So so I think I think and and I'll let Michael chime in too. If if we're if we're going to go down this path and do some sort of analysis before we draft any ordinance, I, I think that PD needs to be involved in doing sort of risk assessment for pretty much all of our facilities because we have a lot of facilities. Um, everything from wastewater treatment plants to to, to city parks, oh, you know, and, and those and the and and obviously city hall and those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, my suggestion is is rather than sort of try and 
kind of like uh, the alarm ordinance revision that we're going to try and do. I think we need information to figure out if this is the way you want to go, perhaps get some input from PD management, maybe even sort of employee department heads, those kinds of things to see who, you know, at least so you have some information from the people on the ground. Councilman Jessica. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, why do we have this guy back here? To, just to uh, he, open the door for council people when they walk in, or it's, it's, it's armed uh, security. I, I think, um, if I remember right, Jim, there was an individual that was coming here. Snuck up behind the mayor, could have shot him. Yep. Yeah. Right Snuck through, that, through door. that front door. And then we had another individual that was bringing in a knife. He's in jail now, uh, <laughs> but that was on a elderly abuse case. It had nothing to do with carrying that knife, um, but. There has been cases, and and I have to to uh, reiterate with with I know it's cliche. Um, we can have all the the laws and the rule in, in the in the land, but if somebody's intent to come in here, whether it's George Sheets back there, and he decides he doesn't he's not going to get his funding, he's not going to obey the <laughs> the law. Well, again, I ask, uh -huh. what's this guy back here doing? You know, I mean, I mean, if, if if that's security, and if he has a, he is armed. I mean, I'm not, I'm not getting this. How many people? I mean, how many people you wanted to circle shoot? I mean, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that, that you know, this guy ought to be on top of his game enough not to let somebody come in that door. And, and and get behind the mayor and and uh, try and knock him off. Um, she had an accomplice who had distracted him back to the uh, hallway. You know, and, and let's While he was back dealing with that, the guy came up around behind the mayor. Um, okay. Mayor, you know, I think the, and you can, I mean, sure, your call if you want to go to the public or not on this one. Um, but I think that the only, the, 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 that's the other issue for debate is are you talking you're talking when the buildings open um, versus versus just city council meetings or city council meeting times because uh, because if you're going to allow firearms in this building um, I, I think it'd be very difficult to enforce well we'll allow them in the building just when there are council meetings or planning commission meetings but not the rest of the time almost impossible to actually enforce that rule um, or in other words create, a, create an exception to the to the you have to lock it up in the locker so this would be essentially an 8 to 5 or 7 30 to 5 30 rule if you're going to allow firearms in the building it'd be, it'd be during the work day when you know there isn't necessarily there is not going to be you know a police officer necessarily in the building so i think that's the other thing you need to kind of consider is is that this rule probably to, for all practical purposes would have to apply all you know if you're going to allow it it's going to be all day long when city staff's here from start to finish, when the buildings even when they have court, on. even when they have court in here. Well, we don't. We have sort of traffic court here, and every once in a while there's um, bankruptcy bankruptcy court. But in neither of those instances do I believe there is any sort of armed bailiff. Um, there, you know, for traffic court, obviously the the officer uh, would appear. The site, the, the officer who did the citation would appear. But for the bankruptcy court, I don't believe there's any any sort of armed security or armed bailiff. So I mean, again, the the point is is that uh, if the building's open, let's say 10 hours a day, it's probably fairly rare during that time period where there is an armed officer in, you know, in the building at any given time. So just keep that's sort of part of your consideration. Mayor Pro Tem, thank you, um, John, for clarification. Legally, is the mayor an officer of the city? Is the mayor uh, mayor is an elected official of the city? Yes. Is there a distinction between an elected official of the city and an officer of the city? An officer, an official. Um, I don't. I mean, it, it, it's sort of semantics at that point. Thank you. So now, it's not let a me police add, officer of the I city. I understand though. that. Okay. Yes. I understand that. Is a garbage collector an officer of the city? 
a, police, uh, a, a, a no. He's an employee, he, he right? He's an employee of the right. city, correct. That was my distinction right. I was trying to right. make. Here again, I think there's a distinct difference between this elected body and employees of the city. I think there's a distinct difference between this elected body and the public as a whole. This is a body, regardless of how austere you think we are, of seven folks that were chosen by the people of this city to make decisions and lead the city. Now, I find it, you know, I'm handing, handing millions of dollars of your money, you being the public now, John, not an officer of the city as our attorney. Um, I'm making policy governing your wife's and your, and your kids' ability to live in this city, make a living in this city, etc. And yet, I don't have the ability to protect myself. That makes no sense. That would almost be like me entrusting you as a lieutenant colonel of the United States Army, telling you the only thing you can do is carry a pop gun. That makes no sense. I, I, I'm not taking a position on this. I'm just sort of laying out, you know. Um, Would it be better if I said squirt gun? <laughs> Something without any yes, bullets? Well, okay. Well, no, my point, is, my, my point is to sort of lay out the relevant facts that, you know, you need to ultimately, if you're going to vote up or down on something, to consider. I, I think, you know, I don't know, I don't know the answer. If the question is, is can the council carry firearms in the building and still exclude the public? I don't know. I thank mean, thank you for saying it that way, because now you've got a chore. I don't know the answer. You can find yeah. it out. Thank perhaps you very much. Legally, you could do that, <laughs> but you know, I, I could certainly look that up. Whether you could. Thank, thank you very much. Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah, okay. look it up, right, please. Right. I would like to know that. Right. Thank you, Councilwoman Orr. Well, I guess I'm kind of with Steve on this. I'm. Has there been an incident? Is there a reason that we're discussing this? Is there? I mean, is other than somebody wants to carry I mean has there been some reason that we are bringing this forward because we've, we've had something happen I'm not, I guess I'm not getting the full scope of what, in, what we're doing. in the past Billy you had somebody right. in a, but now we have Larry yeah but Larry was distracted okay. and or somebody who was there supposed to be Larry was distracted and, and how long and ago was this a couple of years mm -hmm. guy came in the back okay. stood behind the mayor with a sign that could have shot the mayor you also had somebody come in front with other things that could have been very damaging to people. One was a great big knife. Um, there, there have been reasons why somebody would say, I do not feel comfortable not having self-protection in City Hall. Yeah. Well, that was my question and you answered it. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I, I disagree with Jean on this. I, I don't think this is about gun control at all. And uh, I just don't. I, I just think this is, you know, I guess if I want to be safe, maybe I'll be between the two of you. I don't know. Um, I don't have a concealed carry permit, but, you know, I appreciate people's right to, to protect themselves. Um, I don't know. I guess we just maybe need some more information. I don't know. There are so many big issues that we're dealing with today. I'm just, you know, we've spent about half an hour on this so <laughs> okay um, I, th I think this is another one we've uh, kind of worked to death um, again I think times are changing you got people today that uh, don't like an election and decide to commit violence because of it uh, so I think we need to have a threat assessment I think it's appropriate to do that for all of our facilities um, based on that threat assessment we'll look at bringing it back uh, if we feel that we need to have any further action Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next item. D, Buxton Customer Spending Report. That's good. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Mayor, Council, uh, John Heine, uh, Community Outreach Manager. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, provide you with some information that uh, you requested uh, back in December of 2016 uh, regarding consumer spending habits. Uh, this is information that will assist uh, us, uh, the city, in making marketing decisions. It will also assist businesses uh, that are in the city. Uh, we talk about retention. We talk about providing opportunities to help businesses 
uh, do better and be better, this is one tool that we can provide. Uh, also, this will help uh, with tourism in helping us decide who to market to, to bring to the city. So I won't take much more time. The important part's coming up. I'm going to introduce Cheyenne Robinson from Buxton to uh, make the presentation. And then Wendy's going to hand out the, the documents at this time. OK, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. It's a pleasure to be here in Prescott. Looking forward, as uh, John had mentioned, to share with you an executive summary of our findings. Uh, as you all know, you hired us in February to understand um, all the economic conditions that are present and to seek an actual program not only to improve tourism, but to grow those existing businesses and to recruit new retail as, as well. So I'm going to be sharing with you all, uh, first and foremost, giving you a brief background of, of who we are in the event that there's anyone in the audience that may not be familiar with us, why you partnered with us in the first place, how we leverage our industry background to take a proprietary approach, to understand who's spending dollars within Prescott, where they locate it, what type of households are they in, their lifestyle habits and, uh, and buying habits, and who are the retailers that best fit all the businesses that are here already and complement all the conditions that you have within your market. So I'm not going to share with you today the names of those retailers that we've identified uh, to give you a competitive presence, uh, but John and Wendy both have that list and they're actively working on those prospects and we're supporting your team and as they have that account management support and we'll be taking a look at where we are in our support plan and where we're looking to go from, from here. So as a reminder, you all partner with us because of our industry background. So we've worked with over 3,500 clients over the past two decades in helping them understand who are their best customers, where are they found, and what is the value to their brand so they can increase home run stores and decrease putting a low performer in the marketplace. Trader Joe's, for instance, they partner with us. They were primarily West Coast based. They wanted to expand their footprint across the US. And by knowing who those best customers are and what is the value to their, their, their company for expansion. We also work exclusively with, with Marriott and we have for, for some time now, so it's very likely that the Spring Hill Suites residents in that's here uh, likely had an impact from, from our, our analysis. Just to give you an idea of um, our footprint on the retail side of our business, so in the past 12 months, we've analyzed over 80,000 sites for retailers. Of those 80,000 sites, 7,500 new stores have opened. We've estimated that out of around the, the 32,000 or so new stores in the past year, Buxton's analytics has a direct impact on 25% of the new store openings over the past year. So that gives you a good, uh, good sense to how competitive it really is on, uh, in the retail industry. They're typically evaluating around 10 sites before, the, before they narrow it down to that one. So what we realized that we could reverse that approach on the retail side and take a data-driven drive on the public sector. Now over the past decade, we've worked with over 75, uh, uh, 750 communities and helping them recruit and retain over 35 million square feet of, of retail. We work, we've worked with Flagstaff for, for many years, uh, Apache Junction, we're working with Kingman right now as well. Um, but we've worked with cities as large as Burbank, uh, downtown Dallas, and New Rochelle, which is right outside of, of New York. And how we're able to support all of our clients is by understanding who their best customers are, where they're found, and the value to their business. So for Prescott, we're understanding who are your best citizens and visitors as consumers. Where are those consumers found, and what is the value to, uh, of those consumers to, you as a, to your market as a city? So we leverage um, over 250 data sources that we have in-house at Buxton. One of those is an exclusive partnership with a major credit card processor where we've extracted all the transactions that have occurred in Prescott. Um, and those transactions were from March 2016 to February 2017. And from there, we analyzed who are those consumers that are spending within your market. So at any point when I'm uh, referencing that percent of spend, uh, that is going to be referencing that, that particular uh, partnership that we're, we're leveraging. 
So we're taking a look at all the different makeup of, of customer types. We look at over 71 different groups. Uh, and why we're looking at those different groups is because there's thousands of different variables that we're analyzing. And this is basically how we know if you're a Costco customer, if you're a Sam's Club customer, if you're going to Trader, Trader Joe's versus Netflix or going to the movie theaters. So we group all of the households into these 71 groups to make it actionable for you to understand them as consumers. When we look at the top four spending in Prescott, they make up around 26% of the spend. Now, where are your consumers located? 61% of the spend in Prescott occur from non-residents. So that shows us you have a high impact in drawing your market from the non-residents spending within your, within your market. But then what is the value of those consumers? Who are the retailers that, um, out of the thousands that are out there that we should be focused on for attraction efforts? We're gonna take a look at some of those different categories that we've identified, and we'll dive into each of these, uh, each of these uh, part of our solution here, here deeper. Let me ask you a couple questions real quick. Um, so when you say non-residents, that means somebody that doesn't live within the Prescott City limits? Correct. Okay. Um, and when you talk about um, looking at business activity, are you looking at just businesses within the city limits of Prescott? Uh, so great question. So we're looking at it from a retailer's perspective. So um, as, as mayor, as city council, you guys are, are probably look, thinking of how do I bring more tax revenue in the city and thinking from maybe a political boundary standpoint. For the typical consumer, they're looking at how quickly can I get to what I'm eating. So how fast does it fill up the gas tank? Uh, how quickly can I grab milk and eggs at the grocery store? So for retailers, they're looking at a trade area and how far in minutes will those consumers drive? So for Prescott, we see around 20 minutes minutes is where that most sustainable consumer base is. So we're looking at all the characteristics that are going on, but closer to Prescott is going to be more valuable because those consumers have a, a more opportunity to shop more frequently in your market. So you're, you're collecting the credit card transactions from retailers. Is that correct? Um, so from, yes. Uh, so we're looking at face-to-face -face transactions that occurred within, within Prescott. Okay. And, and that's debit and credit, right? Transactions on credit. Yes, cards. looking at um, through, it's not through just that credit, our provider. It's debit as well. Yeah, yes. just transactions. Just wanted to clarify that because we've gotten that question. So. Okay. So. Great question. So these four um, that we're looking at are the top four that make up the overall spend from your market. So this is looking at residents, non-residents, uh, everyone that's that's spending within uh, within Prescott. Now we group them into these creative names and, and codes. Uh, now these four, as I mentioned, make up around 26% of the spend overall. Uh, now we have a mix of those wealthy, established, empty nesting couples. We've got those affluent families uh, and those upscale boomer aged consumers, as well as those older empty nesting couples uh, that have more of a balanced and, and open open mind. And now uh, some key takeaways here. So if you're an existing business or for the tourism team as well, when they're trying to do targeting, some of uh, the channels that these households like to be reached uh, more prevalently through direct mail and cable t TV. So that's information those existing businesses can leverage as they're trying to reach and, and increase business within their, their market. Now there's 71 different groups that we look at. As I mentioned, these are just the top four that we're analyzing. We also know the differences between the overall spend that has occurred within your market, those that are uh, residents of Prescott, versus those tourists that are coming from f further distances, and um, the day trippers that are coming, spending dollars, but not necessarily staying here overnight. So I know this is kind of a lot to, to look at here. Uh, so we're looking at those different groups. Now we can uh, dive into each one of these if you're an existing business and want to learn about the different customer types spending here and the over 7,500 characteristics that tell us who they are as, as shoppers. Uh, but overall, what this is telling us, uh, so one of the many variables uh, is income. So at the top of the chart, when you're at the A01, those households have a higher income. And that trends down to the more uh, ha the households are seniors and some of those younger digital dependents as, as well. Uh, so this is tell this what this chart is telling us is that your residents are more of a mix of uh, your seniors or those approaching retirement, whereas your tourists are uh, a mix of a more, more diverse group of households with a higher affluency. Um, you also have families that are coming in and spending dollars as well. And then your, your day trippers um, are also a mix of some of those seniors and uh, some of those more established households as well. Mm -hmm. 
Now, when we take a look at the profile, so who are the households that are spending specifically within your hotels? This is looking at the household spend within the hotels within, within Prescott. Now, we talked uh, earlier about AO2, that platinum prosperity type of uh, empty ne nesting established household, and they're one of the most prevalent, but we can see they're only 2% of those spending within your, your hotels. Uh, BO7, that's very prevalent here as well. Now, what that means is that household is more of those established, more fluent uh, families and couples. Uh, and then again, C C13 and C11, who that consumer is, is a more established baby boomer. And they're more, um, most the two most prevalent for those spending within your hot hotels. Uh, now F22, that type of household is over 4% of the spend within your hotels. That's an affluent type of family as well, typically under 35. They've got children zero to three. They're really active and doing activities outside. Uh, so those that are coming and visiting your market and staying overnight, are a very diverse group from, from seniors to middle class and upper middle class families and uh, some of the most wealthy households within the US. Now, I won't, won't bore you into going into each of the different se 71, um, but we do have a full guide for those hoteliers and in, in within the area that want to learn more about who these different customers are. So what is the impact of these consumers that are spinning within your market and where are they coming from across the US? What you're looking at here is a map of the spend that's occurred within Prescott from high in green uh, to very low in, in orange here. And this is showing you a map of spend within your market by what we call a CBSA. So that stands for a core base statistical area, typically a population or a county population of over 10,000. 10, now we look at what, what's making the, the most uh, amount of spend within your area. And the highest is going to come from the Prescott CBSA. Now the Prescott CBSA consists of your entire county. That's 52% of spend. Now of that 52% of spend, 39% comes from Prescott residents. And then 18% of spend comes from the Phoenix Scottsdale metro market within your within your community. Uh, around 3% from LA, and then you get to around 2% from Tucson. Now, out of all the different CBSAs, these four make up 77% of the spending within Prescott. And as we mentioned earlier, and we take a look at everything, uh, all of the, the transactions that have occurred, again, 61% of spend within Prescott occurs from those non-residents. Non uh, now, I mentioned earlier that a retailer, it's great for them to know that LA is coming and spending, spending dollars here, but that visitor attraction is really icing on the cake for them. They care most about who's directly surrounding their store. Where's that day in, day out customer base that's living and working within the retail trade area? So we see for Prescott that that most sustainable customer base is within around 20 minutes of your market. Now when we get beyond the political boundaries and look at that 20 minute drive time, there's over 95,000 potential customers for, for a retailer within that trade area. I'm sorry, say that again, what you just said. Oh, um, there's over 95,000 potential customers within 20 minutes of Prescott. Okay. And 20 minutes is a great drive time to leverage for existing businesses to understand where's that day in, day out cu customer that's within the, the market. Uh, now, we also have mapped out all the transactions to see where's the increase in hotel stay versus where is the, the lo localized spend. Um, so essentially understanding where is that day tripper and where the hotel spend, where does that really begin to start? So we see in around 70 minutes that that is more of your regional trade area, you have consumer coming in, spending dollars within the um, with, within your market. So as you get into Camp Verde, su surprise. But then, uh, yeah, yes, uh, absolutely. And so then, uh, within 70 to 140 minutes, that's really where the day tripper uh, is, is for your market. So those are the households coming in. Some of them are staying overnight, but not as as often. Uh, but coming in, spending dollars, and then going home in the evening. Now, when you get beyond 140 minutes of Prescott, that's when the hotel spend really begins to start to increase and where you're getting those overnight visits. Uh, so from a tourism perspective, it's really helpful for, for their team to know that the increase in who's staying in hotels is primarily coming from those beyond 140 minutes of, of Prescott. Now, now back to looking at, a, for a retailer, where they care most about in that 20 minutes. Did you have a question? 
Okay. Uh, so we're looking within within 20 minutes. We're also looking at all the existing businesses that are here. What's increasing foot traffic? So from Trader Joe's, Costco, uh, looking at Sprouts, the the VA, the YRMC, understanding what's going to increase the traffic. Looking at the co-tenants that that retail likes to locate around as well. And also knowing that you have over $72 million within 20 minutes that's leaving your trade area. So that leakage is occur occurring. So what we want to do is cut that leakage and, uh, and by understanding all the characteristics, the impact of those consumers and who are the retailers that best fit your marketplace. Now when we take a look at the impact overall of that regional consumer, so earlier we looked at just political boundaries, resident versus non-resident. When we get beyond political boundaries and look at those drive time shoppers, within 70 minutes that local customer makes up 39% of spend within Prescott, 16% from those day trippers, and then 45% from the, those tourists within your market, which is validating a lot of probably what you guys already know and that you guys have, a, that the tourism industry has a high impact on your economy. And 45% of all the spend within the past year has come from, from those visitors spending dollars here within Prescott. Now, not only do we know ge geography-wise where those households coming from, what is their impact, we also know where they're spending when they're here. Now, this is looking at the overall spend in your market, uh, the highest being in restaurants, so your full, full service. And then it's most interesting to see that that second highest uh, spend in your market comes from hotels. I've seen most commonly around 6 or 7% for most municipalities and cities that we work with. But to see that being the second highest in 15%, it tells a very strong strong case for the impact of, of the hotel uh, industry and in your economy. Now, 12% occurs from specialty, uh, within specialty stores within Prescott. Now, that's a mix of some of those smaller businesses that may have a variety of, of items that they're carrying, um, from antiques to even jewelry stores would be within, within your specialty. And then 9% within home supply, so your hardware or home improvement type of stores. Fast food's going to be those quick service restaurants, uh, sporting goods. Uh, and then we have 6% within apparel and then going to uh, uh, four, or within department stores, 4% four, uh, 4 within apparel, and then 1% within, uh, within uh, computers. Now the key takeaway here is that high, high spend being the second uh, for, for hotels within your, your market. So once we had a full understanding of who's shopping here, what are the characteristics going on within your your trade area that's, that are important to, to retailers, we're able to... Can I ask you a question before sure. we, So the 12%, is that is that pretty common? with boutique or um, small shops, is that pretty common what you see? Or is that high for a city our size? Um, so that is is high from what I've typically okay. seen. Uh, I, I've, a lot of times That's it's, it's yeah. very common to see home supply be one of those at the top, but um, uh, that also tells a story because when you're, you're traveling, you're not going to necessarily be spending in home yeah. supply, so uh, then that goes back to that shops. impact. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. Absolutely. So what we have done is analyze the thousands of retailers that are out there and identify the types of retailers that are the best fit for all of your conditions that are present. Now we also know um, that you guys have expressed interest in improving and enhancing um, the retail landscape that's, that's here and basically what complements is, is existing businesses and what's going to increase the quality of life. Um, so we've, we've identified a mix of lifestyle type of retailers, destination retailers as well as those that are going to complement the recreation type of lifestyle here in, in Prescott. Uh, so we have a great diverse group of companies that we're actively working with, uh, with Wendy and with John on, uh, our, on our recruitment plan. So where are we now in implementation? We've done all this research. We know who, who the retailers are that we need to be focused on. Uh, we, we started our partnership in February. We did the legwork to understand where we need to be focused in about the, the first 30 days or so. But then we really got started in April at the implementation. So we identified the best point of contact for each of the retailers we're pursuing. We mailed an initial letter to each of those, letting them know that Buxton has conducted an in-depth analysis that validate their brand as a candidate for expansion into Prescott. But, but it doesn't in there. It's not just a study and here's your results and, and good luck. This is a partnership. So we're here to support you guys long term. So whether it's um, with additional research as needed, we're, think of us as an extension of your, your staff. 
We're here to, to guide you throughout that recruitment process and assist you in tracking our results and seeing if there's any need to evolve our strategy because this isn't a, a silver bullet, it's not a crystal ball. We're here to work through, through this with you and uh, help you be successful long term with your strategy and growth for retail but also existing businesses as well. So I mentioned we started implementation in April. So we sent that initial letter out. That was then followed up from Wendy with initial contact, you leveraging our match um, information, so that validation insights. And, but, it, but it doesn't end there. We want to continue to network with these companies. So we encourage our clients to uh, get involved with regional ICSC so, uh, shows, so real estate shows, and continue networking with them. It's a great marketing opportunity as well uh, to get in front of these retailers in person and then continue those ongoing touch points from, from, from there. Um, because this is, a, it is essentially a sales process and we're uh, marketing the city to those right retail prospects. Now, coming up in February, you guys do have the option to continue to develop, develop this roadmap to where we weren't going to let, let the results just end here, but continue the conversations with the retailers that we've identified this year and identify an additional 20, 20 retailers to add to the momentum and continue to develop our pipeline for re retail success. If any of you have a sales background, you know that you have to continually to work on that pipeline with quality, quality prospects and then continue that initial conversation and networking to, to get them to have an interest in your market, so then make that decision, and then from there it's all about speed to market for that retailer. Now where are we in those results to date? All the 20 retailers have been uh, have had a communication sent to them, um, whether it be the letter, phone call, and, and email. Out of those responses, 45% have responded. And of those, 22% have requested more information or to engage with a broker. Now, why this is successful is because we're only about two months into implementation. When we reach out to the retailers, most of them have their sites alleged site selection plans, uh, plans complete, 18 to 24, sometimes even 36 months in advance. So we're getting in front of them today. So as they're planning their next locations within your market, they're not overlooking Prescott. They know where you are, they know that you're here, and they're going to listen to you uh, because you ha you're able to speak that same language through the research that we, we have provide provided to you. Um, now, in addition to this, not listed here, uh, just we just found out that there is a retailer that was on the list that we identified that actually is already coming into the market. Um, we're still working to get engaged with that corporate contact, um, but really exciting to see um, that that company is coming in. It just validates the results that we've done and that we're on the right track to a long-term strategy for success. But we don't want to forget about those existing existing businesses. Um, Wendy and John have access to our uh, online analytics platform called Scout, where you have on-demand access to research and tools to help existing businesses. So if I own a, a jewelry store, for, for instance, in Prescott, I can call Wendy and say, I'd like to understand my trade area. And um, what she'll be able to do is log into the tool and, and look at a trade area around that store, and then say, if these are your consumers that are within your, your trade area. So this is where you're, you're seeing that customer base, and this is who, who they are that you can be targeting and improving your store to better cater to that audience. We can also look at leakage insights. So maybe they're interested in expanding their business portfolio. We can see where there's the highest leakage. So what type of retail are folks leaving your market for? And they can capitalize on that and add that type of business to their portfolio or add more to their card store offerings. And we can also uh, assist with merchandise preferences, so helping with shelf allocation. So if you're trying to open up a restaurant and you're not sure if you need to go with Pepsi or Coke products versus going with the Coca-Cola guy because you're friends, we can tell you what the households are more likely to prefer. Same with, uh, is it Miller Lite or, or, or Coors Light, for, for instance, or what type of music should you be playing uh, in, in your, your retail store. And then a bis a basic insights as well, so demographics to give you a foundation. So maybe you have existing businesses that just want to understand income levels, expenditures on restaurants or uh, apparel. We have that basic information for current year estimates, projections, and also previous year trends as well. And 
uh, this past month, we have also just rolled out a new tool um, outside of a scout. It's called LSMX. It stands for Local Store Marketing Insights, powered by Buxton. Essentially, this is a new tool that we're going to be rolling out for, for Prescott uh, to allow uh, local business owners to be able to go in, see where that best customer is, and actually do something about it and reach them through Facebook, through uh, direct mail, through, through email, through banner ads to those best households for, for their market. So something really exciting that we're going to be sharing with you guys here very soon. So where we are, are overall, we've provided you with all the tools to help you with tourism growth, with new growth uh, for existing businesses, expansion, as well as for business attraction efforts. Uh, and we're going to continue to provide you with, with that support. Uh, the tourism team just finished up their, their marketing plan. They lever leaned on a lot of our information for, for that, that plan that they've put together. Um, Wendy has done a phenomenal job leveraging our partnership to the fullest. So from recruitment to working with the existing brokers and leveraging us to build those relationships. She's already leveraged our recruitment data. She's leveraged demographic insights for different brokers' properties, as well as healthcare insights to see the population and who they are as patients. We can see what you guys are most commonly coming in for, uh, and, and leakage inf data, so that when that bro broker is engaging with the retailer, they can say that, hi, we have this much amount of dollars that's leaving the trade area, and this is a great opportunity for you to consider. And what we're providing you guys is a competitive advantage so that you can respond to any threats or opportunities. Uh, so whether it be a new business that's looking to locate here, providing with meaningful information for them to make that decision, or whether it's helping existing business grow, uh, or if there's a vacancy that's come up, helping you with the information to empower your brokers and your property owners with uh, a data to support helping fill that, that vacancy and whether, uh, versus having it just sit, sit there. And not only were we providing you with all of this uh, information, but a, a dedicated team and support. So uh, whether it's helping with retail recruitment or other, other initiatives, our clients that are most successful are leaning on us and calling on us not only for retail, but for industrial in information. It's not necessarily our, our expertise, but we have workforce information, and we can help with understanding um, how, how gun-friendly is, is, is the consumer, for, for instance, when the, within your area. Uh, we can also understand uh, if, if your workforce is similar to where that industry uh, typically, uh, the type of workers that they typically would, would need. Uh, so we want you guys to continue to le leverage us, not only for recruitment, but any creative uh, uh, initiatives that you may have. There, we have over 250 data sets in the house. There's likely a way that we can get to the answer that you're looking for. And it's not just myself in an office in Fort Worth, Texas. You guys have over 150 of us actively working for you. You've got a full account management team. You have a full a an analytics team. And we're here to support you throughout your economic development initiatives and tourism as well. Were there any additional questions that you guys had on where we are today and where we're looking to go from here? Um, Councilwoman Wilcox. Are you able to segregate data by discrete time periods so that we can determine whether a certain event is drawing more consumer spending from outside the community? With the credit card information, because it is leveraging actual tran transactions, uh, unfortunately there are, are limitations to protect that business, to protect that cardholder. So the snapshot that we look at is that full full year. Um, it also tells us where the most impact is on the economy, um, but no seasonality or our different snapshot on, on that um, is, is not available. But we do have a new data set that we just have in-house that's GPS and, and mo mobile data, um, where we're actually working with some clients within the Tennessee market to look at uh, different uh, uh, different uh, tourism areas and see um, who's came in within the area dif within different seasons. So we have some resources that could help there, but with the, the credit card information, um, there's going to be some limitations there on, on breaking it to se seasonal group. Councilman Zell. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for your presentation. I just had a question. The ongoing partnership, is this part of the original lease or uh, of the contract that we have with you? Or is this an extension of that? Uh, so uh, w uh, where we're going from here? 
Um, so we're we're partnered with you guys uh, currently all the way through um, through February, and we're going to provide you with support. So we we're constructed to provide you with analysis with those results, but that that's not how it, it, this is a partnership. It, it's not just um, a, a date, date analysis. So we are going to continue to support you guys through throughout our partnership. Um, with, it's, if you need additional re research, um, leveraging our analytics platform from Scout, um, we were just talking earlier about a franchise concept uh, that's really really set on a certain site, uh, but we can leverage our platform to look at where that franchisee has other stores and show them, hey, there's there's still opportunity here at these other locations that, that are more uh, ready to go in, in the marketplace. So um, all of that is, is we're providing to you guys at no additional cost. We're that extension, extension of your staff, um, and, and that's just something that we're providing you because we want to make sure that you're successful. Thank you. Councilwoman Orr. Yes, this is absolutely excellent. Thank you. Some really good data that we need to have, and and I believe that we can use. And I know John and Wendy, um, and also our tourism advisory committee, and our Prescott Downtown Partnership, and, and our chamber. I mean, there's just so much that's extremely valuable that that's coming from this. So uh, I think we're just just starting to see where we can go with it, and and I really appreciate it. <laughs> You've gone through a lot, and, uh, and I, I look forward to going through this, and, and certainly if you have any questions, we can give you a call, I'm sure, but uh, especially all the, de all the different demographics and how you've broken this down it will be extremely helpful for, you no know, Prescott Downtown Partnership and, and the Chamber are definitely looking at, you know, local, what can we do locally, and this will give them that information. I think that'll help a lot, so thank you very much. Nice thank job. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, yeah, a very good report. Um, for some clarification, um, you are a representative of the free market. You don't work for the government. Well, you do work for the government. You don't work for the government, right? Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> we had this conversation earlier today, and we, we play a role in investing our citizens and the taxpayers' dollars, not necessarily producing what you produce, but we invest it with you to produce it at the highest and best that it can be produced. Okay, while we provide basic services, police, fire, water, sewer, roads, garbage, we create an environment in the community so that you can excel. And I do appreciate your report. It's very good. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much. I'm sure uh, we all need to take a little time and digest more of this report because it's, it's quite a bit of information here. And uh, um, I guess uh, we can look at John. If we got any questions, you can get with them and get further answers. Okay, great. All right. This Thank meeting's you. adjourned. We'll uh, reconvene in 10 minutes. Thank you.